Between 1800 and 1900, how working people spent their free time changed dramatically. This program uses autobiographical writing and contemporary comment to tell the story of how and why the recreations of the working classes changed. In 1838, Charles Shaw started work at the age of eight in a pottery works. In his autobiography, he recorded his memories of work time and free time. I very soon found out that though I was required to be there six days a week, on Monday morning I was not required to be there before breakfast time. I found too that the place in which I worked bore a holiday aspect on Monday and Tuesday. The entertainment consisted in rough play when the men were drinking on the premises. One favourite form of this was to place a greenware vessel, sufficiently dry to hold water, above a door partially opened and sent for someone. The cuter folks always gave the door a shove before they entered the shop, and down came the water on the floor. But those in a hurry, or the thoughtless or the simple, went forward and got the full contents of the vessel, amid the uproarious jeers of those who were looking on. Colliers and potters rarely work much on Monday. And yet it was rare for any of these men to get on Saturdays less than a full week's wage. From Wednesday to Saturday, they worked themselves and worked others, boys and women, like galley slaves, from four and five in the morning till nine and ten at night. This was Charles Shaw's introduction to working life. Was this how everyone worked in the 1830s? At the 1840 Committee on the Health of Towns, Joseph Fletcher said that handloom weavers absent themselves from work nearly the whole of Saturday, Sunday, the whole of Monday, and a little of Tuesday. Then they work excessively hard from Tuesday until the beginning of Saturday, and often through the whole of Friday night. Until the later 18th century, the organisation of work was often irregular. Those like the handloom weavers who worked at home controlled their own hours of work. Work and leisure often overlapped. In agriculture, market day was partly a social occasion. An irregular work pattern was still found in the pottery workshops in the 1830s, when Charles Shaw began work. The throwers, turners and handlers did little on a Monday and Tuesday, then worked long hours for the rest of the week. Monday was called Saint Monday, because people were so often away from work, it was like a Saint's Day holiday. But for one group of working people, this practice was either fast disappearing or already a thing of the past. At the same committee in 1840, Joseph Fletcher said factory workers were tied to regular hours. For those who worked in factories, the line dividing work and leisure was becoming more and more rigid. The hours of work were set by the factory owner, and what was to happen within those hours was strictly controlled. The lives of the mill workers were run by the clock and the bell. Lists of rules of the mill, like this one from Ainsworth's in Preston, were commonplace. It was the use of machinery that demanded regular hours. The very rigid hours therefore applied particularly in the highly mechanised textile industry. The steam-driven machines were a big financial investment for the mill owners and their concern was to keep the machines working to make a profit on their investment. What little opportunity there was for recreation was in the few hours spent away from the mill. This is how Charles Shaw saw people spending their free time in the 1830s. Bare knuckle fighting and dog fighting were then in much favor. These succeeded the cockfighting of a previous generation. In every street where there was a beer shop, you would probably find a couple of men, stripped to the waist, pounding at each other in regular fisticuff order till they battered each other black and red. Or else a couple of dogs would be devouring each other amid a howling ring of brutal men. The activities which Charles Shaw witnessed were popular pastimes in the first quarter of the 19th century. Cruel sports like cockfighting, Bull baiting and bear baiting were common until, in 1835, the Cruelty to Animals Act made baiting animals for sport illegal. These entertainments were mainly for men. Women had little free time. 
When they weren't working outside the home, they were working in the home. Both men and women did go to the fairs and festivals which were held at intervals throughout the year. A bank holiday fair was a big event. It featured everything from roundabouts and swings to peep shows, animals, waxworks, and plenty of alcohol. But rowdy fairs and blood sports were not the only amusements of working people. Mary Russell Mitford lived at Three Mile Cross near Reading in the 1840s. She saw something quite different. I doubt if there be any scene in the world more animating than a cricket match. The cricket match, I mean, is a real, solid, old-fashioned match between neighbouring parishes, where each attacks the other for honour and a supper, glory and half a crown a man. Our country lads, accustomed to the hammer or the flail, have free use of their arms. They know how to move their shoulders, and they can move their feet too, they can run. A village match is the thing. Where a day labourer is our bowler. A blacksmith, our fielder. Where the spectators consist of the retired cricketers, the veterans of the field. The careful mothers, the girls, and all the boys of two parishes. Where laughing, shouting, and the very ecstasy of merriment and good humour prevail. In the country or town, there was one place which was at the centre of working people's recreation. It was resolved to hold a Maying, a May festival. The business part of the affair was confided to the diligence, zeal, activity and intelligence of that most popular of village landlords, mine host of the Rose Inn. On Mondays and Tuesdays, one or both throwers will be away drinking at a house called the Foaming Quart. Sometimes half the turners will be away drinking too, and always one or both handlers. The pub in the 19th century played a very important part in working people's lives. Why was the pub so important? It was common practice for an employer to pay the workers' wages in the local pub. This cartoon shows a workman getting his wages. In the background, his wife waits with the children. The landlord is indicating how much of the man's drink bill is to be taken off his wages. The pub was a financial centre for working people in more ways than this. The Morning Chronicle in 1849 reported on Birmingham... Anyone who walks along the streets and looks at the bills in public houses may see at a glance how deep a hold the club system has taken. Sickness and burial clubs, clothing clubs, medical attendance clubs were all based in pubs. Each week, members of the club paid their subscriptions and the fund, held by the landlord, in time paid money to them for clothing, medical help or to bury them. The expansion of building in towns in the early 19th century made pubs even more popular. The relentless march of bricks and mortar, as it's described in this cartoon, left few open spaces in which working people could spend their free time. The effect of this was commented on in Edwin Chadwick's 1842 sanitary report. This said about Birmingham... There are no places where the working people can resort for recreation. The consequence is that they frequent the alehouses. The pub was the only place people could go to get away from cramped and squalid homes. It was a haven of warmth, light and often entertainment. Concert rooms were attached to pubs. These were the only places of entertainment for working people. In the middle of the 19th century, the concentration of working people's free time around the pub and alcohol was a cause for much discussion and concern. In the public house and the gin shop are to be found swearing, cursing, lewdness and disorder. Examine the history of thousands of young men transported to New South Wales and you will find that the chief cause of their misfortune has been their love of strong drink. He's convinced that drinking alcohol is at the root of all evil. He's a member of the temperance movement that campaigned to ban spirits and, in some cases, all alcohol. He's quoting a temperance writer, Joseph Livesey. 
The frequenters of taverns and gaming houses on Sunday openly insult the laws of the land. Laws which will be held sacred by all good citizens, even if the law of God were not against them. She's concerned for religious reasons. She doesn't think people should do anything recreational on Sunday, but just go to church. She's quoting from a religious writer, Hannah Moore. Sunday being the only leisure day for working men, they naturally seek recreation on that day. In other countries in Europe, every facility is made available on Sundays. Music, the museums and public libraries all display their attractions. There is no place of public resort in this metropolis open on Sundays. It is no wonder working men seek the alehouse. He's a member of the respectable working class. He wants working people <coughs> to have access to more places of recreation, not just the pub. He's quoting the chartist William Lovett. The Birmingham mechanic will not, in general, if ever, work more than five days a week. He frequently spends Monday in the alehouse, and when trade flourishes, it is common to find him only four days at his employment. Any manufacturer in the town will affirm my statement to be correct. He's a factory owner. He thinks his workers' recreations keep them away from work. He's quoting a letter to the Birmingham Journal in 1840. At present, the working classes frequent in great numbers the races, fairs and periodical merrymakings. Some regulated amusements should surely be provided within the reach of our working men as a matter of policy. It is wise to provide safety valves in regulated amusements. If not guided by the government or the rich, they will fly to dangerous courses. He's concerned about public disorder at fairs and festivals. He wants to see more controlled recreations. He's quoting the MP Robert Slaney. In the second half of the 19th century, different reformers tried to offer working people other forms of amusement to take them away from the pub.